there are payments and rewards for every level of achievement. In the realm of soulful music, one name reigns supreme, a name that resonates with the deepest corners of the heart, evoking feelings of love and passion with every note, Barry White. Let the music play. I just want to dance. His velvety baritone voice, often accompanied by the sultry sounds of his orchestra, created the soundtrack to countless romances and intimate moments. Barry White's discography reads like a journey through the sweetest symphonies of love. Hits like Can't Get Enough of Your Love, Babe, You're the First, The Last, My Everything, and Never Never Gonna Give You Up are timeless classics that continue to serenade lovers around the world. His music transcended generations, becoming an anthem for lovers young and old. That music is my life saver. That's why I dedicated my life to that lady. Yet amid the harmonious melodies and passionate lyrics, Barry White's life was fraught with health challenges, weight struggles, and a love for food that bordered on addiction. These factors would ultimately set the stage for a puzzling and controversial end to the musical legend's life. In any case, Barry White's death was not only marked by sorrow, but also by controversies that extended into the division of his substantial estate. The intricate family dynamic he left behind included a legal wife, an estranged wife, adult children born both within and outside of wedlock, a girlfriend who had been his devoted companion during his final days, and a child she claimed to be his. One of the most contentious issues post Barry White's passing was the distribution of his estate. While he had a will in place, it had not been updated to include the new individuals who had entered his life since his separation from his second wife, Claudine James. Consequently, his girlfriend, Catherine Denton, who had initially served as his assistant before becoming his lover, took legal action to secure a portion of his estate. She argued that Barry had intended for her to continue living a life of luxury in his Los Angeles residence, and that her lawsuit was a sincere effort to fulfill his wishes. Barry White's children also played a significant role in the controversies that unfolded. One of his daughters expressed doubts about Catherine Denton's claims that her child was Barry's biological offspring, asserting that her father father had eight children, not nine. This raised pertinent questions about the legitimacy of Catherine's paternity claims. However, despite these disputes, Barry White's will did explicitly specify that Catherine Denton should inherit his Los Angeles home. Ultimately, she sold the property to a real estate developer for nearly $3 million, less than two years after Barry White's passing. What's more, decades after his untimely demise, Barry's son, Daryl White, sued his stepmother over claims that he deserved to get a bigger share of his famous father's estate. In 2017, Daryl filed suit against Barry's estate and widow Glodian White, where he alleged that he was never shown his father's will and is now almost broke and homeless after payments made to him from the estate dried up in September 2015. In the court documents, Daryl said he agreed not to challenge the amount of money he was getting after his late father's second wife told him he'd get his fair share. He then asked the court to give him access to the will and make a proper accounting of what he is due. According to him, Glodian was using up the money to support a lavish lifestyle. These are just a few of the scandals that have hit Barry's family since his demise. But let's go back in time and have a look at the life Barry led and what caused his untimely demise. Barry Eugene Carter, popularly known as Barry White, left an indelible mark on the music industry with his deep bass voice and undeniable charm. Born on September 12, 1944, in Galveston, Texas, Barry White's life journey was nothing short of a roller coaster ride filled with ups, downs, and sensational music that set the mood for romance in the 1970s and beyond. Barry White's rise to fame was not without its fair share of drama and surprises. From his early years in Galveston to his teenage escapades and life-altering moments, here's a juicy look at the man behind the sultry voice and the steamy hits that made him a legend. Barry White's parents, Melvin A. White and Sadie Marie Carter, never tied the knot, which led to a rather unique twist in his life. His mother gave him her last name, but as fate would have it, he later adopted his father's surname. This twist of fate would be just one of many that would shape Barry's remarkable journey. The backdrop for his formative years was the Watts neighborhood in South Central Los Angeles, California. Growing up in this vibrant and sometimes challenging environment, he found solace in music. Barry's mother had a penchant for classical tunes and young Barry eagerly listened to her extensive collection. His fascination with music began to take root, and he started tinkering with the piano, trying to 
recreate the magic he heard on those vinyl records. Barry White's musical talents were apparent from a young age, and the story goes that at just 11 years old, he played the piano on Jesse Belvin's 1956 hit single, Good Night My Love. However, in a surprising twist, Barry denied any involvement in writing or arranging the song during a 1995 interview. He believed that the story had been blown out of proportion by overzealous journalists. While it's true that he and Belvin lived in the same neighborhood, there was a significant age gap between them, with Belvin being 12 years older. Despite the ambiguity surrounding his early career, Barry's talent couldn't be denied. He attended Jacob A. Rius High School, an all-boys academy in Southeast Los Angeles. His voice underwent a dramatic transformation when he turned 14, deepening considerably. Barry reminisced, I had a normal squeaky kid voice as a child. Then as a teenager, that completely changed. My mother cried because she knew her baby boy had become a man. His deep, velvety voice was a gift that would one day captivate the world. But Barry White's path was not without its detours. At the age of 16, he found himself behind bars for a daring heist involving $30,000 worth of Cadillac tires. In today's currency, that would be approximately equivalent to $290,000. During his stint in jail, Barry had a transformative experience that would set the stage for his future. He heard Elvis Presley crooning, It's now or never on the radio, and that moment left an indelible mark on his soul. Barry credited this encounter with changing the course of his life, but the real turning point came on his 18th birthday. On the very day he was supposed to return to high school, Barry decided to skip class and make a pilgrimage of sorts to the Capitol Records headquarters in Hollywood. He stood across the street from the office, gazing at it for hours, absorbing the lively atmosphere that surrounded it. This experience ignited a fire within him, inspiring him to pursue a career in Hollywood and the entertainment industry, even though he had no formal training in reading or writing music. Anyway, following his release from prison, White abandoned his involvement in gang activities and embarked on a music career during the early 1960s initially as a member of singing groups. His debut release, Too Far to Turn Around, came in 1960 as part of the Upfronts. Subsequently, he worked with various small independent record labels in Los Angeles, recording singles under his own name in the early 1960s. He was often backed by vocal groups like The Atlantics and The Majestics. It's worth noting that White was mistakenly credited with producing Bob and Earl's 1963 hit single, Harlem Shuffle, a claim he refuted in his 1999 autobiography confirming that Gene Page was the actual producer. In 1965, White took on the role of producer for the track Feel All Right by the Bel Cantos, which was released on the Downey label. In 1966, under the alias Lee Berry, he recorded his first single, Man Ain't Nothing, also on the Downey label. Furthermore, he co-wrote Together Forever, a song released by Pat Powdrill and the Power Drills in 1967. During the mid-1960s, Bob Keane of Delphi Records hired White as an A&R man for his newly established Bronco Records imprint. White began collaborating with the label's artists, including Viola Wills and the Bobby Fuller Four, in various capacities such as songwriter, session musician, and arranger. He played a pivotal role in discovering singer Felice Taylor and arranging her successful song I Feel Love Coming On, co-written with his friend Paul Polity, which achieved significant popularity in the UK. White and Polity continued to write chart-topping hits for Taylor, including It May Be Winter Outside, but in my heart, it's spring, and under the influence of love. In 1969, White signed a producer deal with Forward Records of Los Angeles, a division of Transcontinental Entertainment Corporation. White's breakthrough as a producer came in 1972 when he discovered and produced a girl group called Love Unlimited. Modeled after the Motown girl group The Supremes, the members had honed their talents under White's guidance for two years before signing contracts with Uni Records. With the help of music industry businessman Larry Nunes, who provided financial support, their album was recorded and presented to Russ Regan, the head of Uni Records. The album, titled From a Girl's Point of View, We Give to You, Love Unlimited, released in 1972, marked the beginning of White's series of albums and singles with lengthy titles. Following Regan's departure from Uni Records for 20th Century Records, White's relationship with Uni soured, leading to a shift of his production deal and the Love Unlimited group to 20th Century Records. 
Throughout the 1970s, they produced several hits, including I Belong to You, which spent over five months on the Billboard R&B chart in 1974, including a week at number one, and Under the Influence of Love Unlimited, which reached number three on the Billboard Pop Album charts. On July 4, 1974, White married the lead singer of the group, Glodian James. In 1973, White founded the Love Unlimited Orchestra, initially intended as a backing band for Love Unlimited. However, White took a different direction and released the single Love's Theme in 1973, which he wrote and performed with the orchestra. The song reached number one on the Billboard pop charts. In 1974, the Love Unlimited Orchestra released their first album, Rhapsody in White, which included Love's Theme. White continued to release albums with the orchestra, and although the orchestra stopped producing albums in 1983, they continued to serve as White's backing band. White initially intended to collaborate with another musical act, but had a change of heart and decided to work with a solo male artist. While working on demo recordings for the male singer, White unintentionally created three demo recordings of his own, singing and playing music. Larry Noons, upon hearing these demos, insisted that White should re-record and release them as a solo artist. White resisted this suggestion for several days, but eventually, Nunes's persuasion convinced him to release the songs as a solo artist, even though he was initially hesitant to step into the spotlight as a singer. Subsequently, White went on to write several more songs and record them, ultimately culminating in the creation of a full album of music. Initially, he contemplated using the moniker White Heat for his solo venture, but he eventually opted to use his own name. It wasn't until the label copy was being prepared that White finally made the decision to embrace a solo career. This marked the beginning of his debut solo album, I've Got So Much To Give, which was released in 1973. The album featured the title track and his first solo chart-topping hit, I'm Gonna Love You, Just A Little More Baby. I can't help myself if I wanted to. This track reached number one on the Billboard R&B charts and number three on the Billboard Pop charts in 1973, maintaining a presence in the top 40 for an extended period. While his success on the pop charts gradually waned with the decline of the disco era, White continued to maintain a dedicated fan base throughout his career. Despite releasing several albums in the following three years, he struggled to replicate the earlier successes, with none of his singles managing to crack the Billboard Hot 100, except for Change in 1982, which climbed to number 12 on the Billboard R&B Top 20. His record label venture imposed significant financial burdens on White, prompting him to shift his focus towards touring and eventually leading to the closure of his label in 1983. After a four-year hiatus, White signed with A&M Records and, in 1987, released The Right Night and Barry White. The single Show You Right from this album made its mark on the Billboard R&B charts, reaching number 17. In 1989, White unveiled The Man Is Back and achieved three top 40 singles on the Billboard R&B charts. The 1990s saw a resurgence of White's popularity, thanks to a nostalgia trend for 1970s music. After contributing to the song The Secret Garden, Sweet Seduction Sweet, on Quincy Jones's 1989 album Back on the Block, White made a triumphant comeback with a series of increasingly successful albums. In 1991, his album Put Me In Your Mix reached number eight on the Billboard R&B Albums chart, and the title track climbed to number two on the Billboard R&B Singles chart. In 1994, White released The Icon Is Love, which topped the Billboard R&B Album charts, and the single Practice What You Preach gave him his first number on the Billboard R&B Singles chart in nearly two decades. The album earned a Grammy nomination in the Best R&B Album category, though it lost to TLC's Crazy Sexy Cool. In 1996, White collaborated with Tina Turner on the duet In Your Wildest Dreams. The same year, he contributed to the Space Jam soundtrack, featuring a duet with Chris Rock called Basketball Jones, a remake of Cheech and Chong's 1973 classic. White's final album, Staying Power, released in 1999, produced his last hit song, Staying Power, which reached number 45 on the Billboard R&B charts. This single earned him two Grammy Awards in the categories of Best Male R&B Vocal Performance 
and best traditional R&B vocal performance. Despite his soaring success, Barry White's life was plagued by health issues. He was a towering figure at 6 feet 4 inches and weighed a staggering 364 pounds, which categorized him as morbidly obese with a BMI of 44.7. The roots of his obesity can be traced back to his childhood, where food scarcity led to his later food addiction. You see, growing up in poverty with a mother struggling to put food on the table, Barry developed unhealthy eating habits, including stealing food to satisfy his insatiable appetite. His addiction to food, coupled with other risk factors such as smoking, led to severe health problems. Smoking was another major contributor to his deteriorating health. His biographer reported witnessing Barry White routinely smoke up to 150 cigarettes a day during their time working together on his biography. Smoking, obesity, and high blood pressure became a dangerous trio that would ultimately affect his heart. In 1998, while working on his biography, Barry White's health was already in decline. He was plagued by dizzy spells and shortness of breath, symptoms he attributed to fatigue. However, these were early indicators of his deteriorating health. In August 1995, during a concert in Los Angeles, Barry nearly collapsed on stage, a stark reminder of his escalating health problems. Despite his health struggles, Barry White embarked on the World Icon Tour in the summer of 1995, a grueling 18-month tour spanning 30 countries and 50 concerts. This tour took a toll on his body, and his blood pressure skyrocketed. Unable to complete the tour, he had to leave it prematurely. In October 1995, he suffered a minor stroke at his Las Vegas home. The stroke was a warning sign of the underlying health issues that would continue to plague him. After the stroke, he embarked on a challenging journey towards recovery, relearning how to walk and talk. However, his determination to continue his music career often overshadowed his health concerns. Despite his family's best efforts to manage his health, Barry White's condition deteriorated further. He was diagnosed with kidney failure in September 2002, which necessitated regular dialysis. A kidney transplant was considered, but his health wasn't stable enough to undergo the procedure. As his health continued to decline, Barry White experienced a series of severe cardiac events, seizures, and strokes. He ultimately suffered a heart attack, leading to his hospitalization. The stress from disagreements about his care among family members and his girlfriend Catherine Denton added to his deteriorating health. Barry White's health battles ultimately took him to a point of no return. On July 4, 2003, at the age of 58, he passed away due to cardiac arrest. It was a somber end for a man who had brought so much joy and romance to the world through his music. In any case, decades after his demise, fans still consider Barry as one of the greatest music icons of all time. There will only be one Barry White, rest in peace big guy, you were and are loved by so many people all over the world," one fan commented. And another fan added, he was ahead of the pack when it came to his singing, thank God for all the videos, records, and so on. Barry had a voice that was unique and will live on forever. Anyway, that's it for this video folks, bye.